Good morning, and a very warm welcome to Silver Birch Evangelical Church this morning. It's lovely to see you here. It's great to be back for our second service since the lockdown, and uh, what joy we had last week, didn't we? Just being, being able to see each other uh, together once again in the church building. Still, there are many of us who are unfortunately unable to be with us this morning, so this morning we're doing our first live stream uh, through YouTube, so we want to welcome all of those who are watching online uh, through, that, uh, through that media. Uh, indeed, after we uh, live stream, it will be available on YouTube to watch later uh, today as well. So a special welcome to all the visitors uh, with us this morning, those who are watching, and uh, we're delighted that you've tuned in or are able to be with us this morning. We trust that you will be blessed by our service uh, this morning. If there are any technical hiccups, you will excuse us. We are quite um, naive or just learning this technology, so please bear with us if there are any hiccups. Uh, I would like particularly to thank at the beginning uh, to Matt Matthew Weir, who set up the AV table desk and got it reconfigured, and to, uh, to Daniel Blaine, who has worked so hard with us to try and get the live streaming aspect of this and sound uh, set up. So thank you to guys. A lot of work has gone into this. This morning, we're continuing our theme of praise and worship, and uh, our speaker this morning is Ian McCulloch, and we look forward to hearing him later in the service. Uh, we will finish the service this morning with our first opportunity to communally break bread together uh, as a church. Um, I will give a, th a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread and wine at the end, so our, f our friends and folks at home who wish to do so uh, can uh, join with us, even though they're joining through the media of the uh, YouTube live stream. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that you have brought into our hearts. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, whom you give to us as a free gift. We thank you for the fact that his death and his resurrection has secured for us eternal salvation and that we have the confidence that we do not stand in our own righteousness, but we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. We thank you that you have been able to, you have brought us together to remember him this morning. And we just ask this morning that whether uh, we're present here in the building or whether we're watching from home, that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and that he would comfort us and direct us in these difficult days. We do pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray that for all of those in society who are tackling the pandemic throughout the country and indeed the world, we ask that you would give them wisdom and grace as they do so deal with this. But Father, we thank you that we have you to anchor our faith in and our trust is in you and these things have happened for your purposes, even though they may be hidden from us at this time. And Father, we just ask that you would encourage our hearts uh, to stand strong in Jesus Christ through these days. So Father, we just ask your blessing upon this meeting and on the end as he opens your word, and may our hearts exalt you and bring praise to you this morning. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
This reading is from Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew like des the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seeds, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Good morning, everyone. I have to say it's great to be back in church again. Uh, there's something really special and important about being together in person, isn't there? And particularly this morning uh, when we're going to have the opportunity to share in communion together. Mind you, there's also something vaguely disturbing as I look down at a sea of masked faces in front of me. I have a strange urge to put my hands up and say, don't shoot, take what you want. I think I must have watched too many Westerns as a child. But whether we're here in person or we're watching online, it's great to be able to praise God together. And that's our theme for this morning, carrying over from last week, praise and thanksgiving to God. My thanks to Amy for uh, doing the reading for us this morning, and I would like to take Psalm 126 as my starting point and framework for the few thoughts that I would like to share with you this morning. It's uh, one of a short group, it's one of a group of short psalms that follow on from the longest psalm in the Bible, and there are just six verses here rather than the 176 of Psalm 119, so it's a wee bit more accessible for us this morning. These 15 psalms are grouped together, each with the same title. You might have noticed if you were following the reading, the title is A Song of Ascents or A Song for the Ascent to Jerusalem. And it's thought that they were sung by pilgrims either as they made their way up to Jerusalem or at the temple itself in preparation for worship on the great festive occasions that the Jewish people held like uh, Passover and the Pentecost and the Feast of T Tabernacles. The word ascent obviously means uh, a going up. Uh, Jerusalem was on a hill after all. But a, a modern Israeli, I believe, would also understand the word as the return from exile uh, to the ancestral homeland. And that, of course, has been happening more or less continuously in waves of immigration since 1948. So the Psalms are all about exile, coming back from exile, worshiping God. It's all about putting the focus back on God and putting God back at the center of the nation once more. It's thought that they were probably composed for one particular festival in 445 BC, which was led by Ezra and Nehemiah to celebrate everything that God had done in bringing his people back to Jerusalem from exile. Philip, in his introduction last week, mentioned, uh, reminded us uh, of that particular festival. And indeed, Psalm 126 here starts by referring to that amazing restoration in the first half of the psalm. What an amazing event it was. It was like a dream come true. It seemed absolutely unbelievable. What a, a, a source of celebration and praise it was. What joy, says the psalm. The people were filled with laughter and sang for joy. Even the nations round about Israel recognized that God's hand was in this. It was just so unexpected and amazing after so many years in captivity in a foreign land that they had been resettled in Jerusalem. And now by the time of this great uh, celebration in 445 BC, God had done even more for them. The temple had been rebuilt and the city walls had been restored. There was so much to praise God for. These people had seen God work in their circumstances. 
in rescuing them and in restoring them to their lands. And that's a reminder, obviously, for us that even now in adverse circumstances, God is still at work, working out his purposes. It's not much wonder then that these psalms continued to be used by pilgrims over the years in preparation for worship because they were returning to the temple, the focus of the nation's spiritual life, to give praise and thanks to God for all that he had done for them. Jerusalem and the temple were very special for the Jewish people because they symbolized God's presence and all that God had done to give them stability and standing as a nation. It was really important for them to go something that they were glad to do, as the Psalm 122 tells us. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, I don't know whether you feel like an exile coming back to SEC. We haven't exactly been away for 70 years, and the elders and leadership team have done absolutely everything they, they could to create a sense of togetherness online. But I want to suggest that as Christians, when we come together to worship, we come with a similar joy as the Jewish people had, a similar appreciation that we're coming to the Lord's house. We're going up to the Lord's house. I don't think it's stretching things too far to suggest that as Christians, uh, and indeed the, the very first psalm in this group of 15 suggests that, that we can identify with these pilgrims going up to Jerusalem, exiled as they were during, as we are during the week, so to speak, in a world whose values are increasingly more alien and ungodly. And then with a special opportunity to come up into God's presence on a Sunday. It's true, of course, that time and place are not necessarily significant. We can and, and should come before the Lord anywhere and at any time to worship him from our hearts. But coming together regularly with others specifically to worship and remember what God has done for us in Christ is really very special. After all, the Lord instructed the disciples to do just that, eating the bread and drinking the wine in remembrance of him. As the Jews appreciated their temple uh, as a place to experience God's presence, so we come with an appreciation of the body of Christ, which is the church worldwide, meeting locally all over the world as a place where we can remind our hearts of the cohesion and stability that God has brought into our lives and the standing, the special standing that we have in Christ, a place where together we can meet and know the very presence of God. We come because such a place means something to us, because the Lord himself has promised that where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. It's a very special place, not because of the building as such, it could just as easily be a tin hut, but because we meet the Lord. Psalm 122, another in this group of 15, puts it like this. All the people of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires. We come, praise God, not because the law requires it, but because the Lord requests it. And we come because the Lord has done such amazing things for us. So if we can identify with these ancient Jews going up into the presence of God at the temple, how much more we can identify with the themes of these 15 songs that were on their lips as they attended the great festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, these were powerful reminders about fundamental aspects of God's relationship with his people and a great stimulus to praise. 
And as we come to share communion together this morning, just as the Jews could recall the great Passover deliverance, deliverance from Egypt, we recall the Paschal Lamb that was Jesus who shed his blood on the cross for our redemption. As they remembered God's material provision for them at harvest time at Pentecost, we too celebrate a God who provides for us and more particularly has given us the gift of his spirit at Pentecost. And at that Feast of Tabernacles, as they recalled God's care for them as they wandered in the desert before reaching the promised land, so we too, as God's special people, rejoice and are confident that God will lead us right to the end as his pilgrim people to a place where we will be with him. But I think it's also worth noting that Psalm 126 not only looks back to a time of great deliverance, but it looks forward in the second half of the psalm. It looks forward to what lies ahead. It doesn't content itself with the reasons it has to praise God, however important they are. Yes, there is a security and there's a comfort, there's a joy in getting back to how things were, but isn't there also a danger if we don't keep looking ahead? It's a great encouragement to remember and praise God for what he's done in the past. We have so much to thank God for here in Silver Birch Evangelical, how he has provided for us. But it's also absolutely essential that we keep looking ahead to what he is going to do. This is a really important balance. The psalmist in the second half of Psalm 126 recognized that there was so much still to do, much planting, much hard work, much weeping, as he puts it, before the joy of a future harvest. And no church can afford to sit on its laurels. There are questions that we must always be asking as a church. What is God wanting to do next? How do we accomplish that work in his grace and power? What structures need to be in place? And holding on to old structures and ways of doing things may not be appropriate for what God has planned to do in a post-COVID-19 generation. Because you can't read the scriptures without recognizing that God is a God who is constantly doing new things. He is not static in time. He does not constrain us in a straitjacket. He's constantly leading his people on. And it may very well be that in this time of upheaval, when we've had these changes thrust upon us, that God is in fact preparing the way. He's shaking us up a little to prepare us to think about the changes that might need to be made for us to carry on his work here in Silver Birch. There is always a danger, is there not, that we get so used to the old familiar ways of doing church, a danger that we get so comfortable with them that we begin to rely on them and we begin to see them as sacrosanct rather than simply as the vehicle for the expression of our worship, our witness, and our fellowship together. I was reminded recently of the passage in Matthew 9 when Jesus asked, was asked, why did the Pharisees and John the Baptist disciples fast and your disciples don't? And basically the question was this, why do your followers not stick to the time-honored and traditional way of doing things? the way it's always been done. Why don't they do what serious religious people do? And Jesus, of course, was bringing in something really new. He was bringing in and establishing his new covenant, but the Pharisees didn't recognize that. Jesus gave the answer to the question, you don't patch an old garment 
with new cloth that hasn't been shrunk, or it will pull away and leave an even bigger hole. You don't put new wine into old wineskins, or the skins will burst and spill the wine. God is constantly pouring out new wine, as symbolized in that first great miracle at Cana of Galilee. He's pouring out new wine, new life in Christ, generation by generation, and that new wine needs new containers, new structures, new ways of doing things for it, in turn, to become mature. If we try to hold on to the old structures for this job, we're in danger maybe of preventing that process because the old structures are not capable of containing the new wine because the structures themselves are not the wine. It's the maturing of the wine for each generation that is so important. Sometimes you hear people decry the fact that there are so many denominations and wonder why God didn't give us a detailed blueprint for how we do church. But God is the God of infinite variety. We just have to look around at nature. He's a creative and generous God who doesn't put us in a straight jacket. He gives us the freedom to express our faith in different ways that are relevant to different times and different personalities. Our biblically based denominations and the structures and programs within them are the wineskins, allowing us the freedom of the expression of our faith. And they only dishonor God when we move from a biblical base or when we squabble amongst ourselves, or when we claim in our pride to be the only valid structure. The old wineskins have served us well. They have done their job. They have held us together as we have hopefully matured a little in Christ. But there's always that danger that we're so comfortable with them that we see them as more important than they are. And we fail to see that they may be inadequate for a generation to come. God forbid that we should put our comfort before what God would do among us. And to continue the metaphor, let's remember what happens to wine when it's been kept too long. I believe that bottles that have been kept for decades can exchange hands for incredible sums of money. I think the, the record was something like 430,000 pounds for a bottle uh, of 73-year-old uh, red wine. But these bottles are rarely drunk for one simple reason. The wine is likely to have gone stale and be undrinkable. The Pharisees made that mistake of focusing on forms, on habits, on structures, on rules, and they substituted the wineskin for the wine and squeezed out any genuine worship, any authentic response to God from the heart. And what is really tragic for them is that their traditions were priceless to them. But in reality, their religion was stale and unfit for purpose. May God give us the grace to know when that is happening. When our patterns of worship have been disrupted as they have been by COVID-19, it's good to come back from exile. There is a joy that what has been lost is being restored. And as we give thanks shortly for all that God has done, let's also look forward to where God is leading us. It's very natural to want to get back to the old familiar structures, and many of them will still be valid. But let's not make an idol out of how things are done. If we're too attached to a wineskin, maybe we need to set it aside if it's had its day. Let's focus on the future, on the work and the challenges ahead 
as God pours out his new wine as he will. And then in the words of the psalm, there will be a new song of praise to sing as yet a new harvest comes in. That's the focus of Psalm 126. May it be our focus as well. God bless his work.
Thank you to Amy for the reading and for the praise team in leading us in praise this morning. And also thanks to Ian for his ministry to us, uh, reminding the joy that we have when we come out of exile. God has done great things for us, and we give him the glory and the praise for that. In a few minutes, I'll be giving thanks for the bread and the wine. Uh, so those of you at home uh, can join with us, if you wish, in your own home. Here in the building, uh, the, you will be served where you are sitting by the deacons after I give thanks for the bread and wine. Corinth was a large Roman seaport, metropolitan area that was very, very active and very modern in its nature. It faced many of the problems that we face in our society today, uh, rampant immorality and various teachings. And it was hard to distinguish for the, the, the people in the, the city, and particularly the Christians, the right from the wrong. But thankfully, Paul wrote to the Corinthians some guidance on how they should run their church. And this is one of the things that Ian was talking about, things that we hold precious and dear to us. And as we come to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in communion this morning, it is one of the key cornerstones of what we do. just want to read the passage that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, just to remind us once again, we often read it when we come to do, have communion with the Lord and each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27 says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as as you drink it. For every time you drink, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against it, against the blood, body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourselves before eating the bread, and drinking the cup. Six very quick things. Paul receives or presents what he received from Jesus himself directly. The bread that is broken is the Lord Jesus' body broken, given for you and for me. The wine, the cup of wine, is his new covenant, his new promise, his new guarantee to you and me that we are in a new environment, a post-exile environment. We're no longer strangers. We are restored and we are brought in to the family of God and we are having fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ where two or three ain't mentioned to us, where two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord Jesus is here with us. And by doing this, we are proclaiming, announcing that this is the Lord's death and we're doing it temporarily because one day he is coming back to take us to be with him. And we won't need a remembrance because we will have the real thing, our Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that will be. And finally, we're just asked to examine our hearts as we do this. Are we doing it out of that heartfelt love for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Lord Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Let us just give thanks for the bread and the wine. Our Father, what a privilege it is to come into your holy presence and to worship you. You are a mighty, wonderful God, a God immense in his being, wonderful in his nature, perfect in all that he does, and loving beyond measure. We thank you that this morning, that as we take the bread and the wine to remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we do it in communion with Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we take the bread, we remember that there was a consequence that Jesus paid. His body was broken. We thank you for the thorns that you wore. We love you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us. And as we take the cup, we thank you for the blood that was shed, the evidence of a new covenant, guaranteed, absolute, firm, never to be, uh, to be destroyed, an established promise from Almighty God that you are my children and I love you. And what a privilege it is to be together this morning, to be able to do this and to do it in remembrance of Jesus. We thank you and bless you for all that you've done. Amen. Thank you. 